And now, Chapter 21, Summary Description of Lord Krishna's Pastimes. After returning from the spiritual kingdom, which he was able to visit personally with Krishna, Arjun was very much astonished. He thought to himself, that although he was only an ordinary living entity, by the grace of Krishna, it had been possible for him to see personally the spiritual world. Not only had he seen the spiritual world, but he had also personally seen the original Mahavishnu, the cause of the material creation. It is said that Krishna never goes out of Vrindavan. Vrindavanam Paritya Na padam ekam gachati. Krishna is supreme in Mathura. He is more supreme in Dvorka, and he is most supreme in Vrindavan. Krishna's pastimes in Dvorka are displayed by his Vasudev portion. Yet there is no difference between the Vasudev portion manifested in Mathura and Dvorka and the original manifestation of Krishna in Vrindavan. In the beginning of this book, we have discussed that when Krishna appears, all his incarnations, plenary portions, and portions of the plenary portions come with him. Thus, some of his different pastimes are manifested not by the original Krishna himself, but by his different portions and plenary portions of incarnation. Arjun was therefore puzzled about how Krishna went to see the Karana Navasai Vishnu in the spiritual world. This is fully discussed in the commentaries of Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur. It is understood from the speech of Mahavishnu that he was very anxious to see Krishna. It may be said, however, that since Mahavishnu took away the Brahmin's sons, he must certainly have gone to Dvorka to do so. Therefore, why did he not see Krishna there? A possible answer is that Krishna cannot be seen even by the Mahavishnu lying in the causal ocean of the spiritual world unless Krishna gives his permission. Thus Mahavishnu took away the Brahmin sons one after another, just after their births, so that Krishna would come personally to retrieve them, and then Mahavishnu would be able to see him there. If that is so, the next question is this. Why would Mahavishnu come to Dvorka personally if he were not able to see Krishna? Why did he not send some of his associates to take away the sons of the Brahmin? A possible answer is that it is very difficult to put any of the citizens of Dvorka into trouble in the presence of Krishna. Therefore, because it was not possible for any of Mahavishnu's associates to take away the Brahmin's sons, he personally came to take them. Another question may be raised. The Lord is known as Brahmanya Dev, the worshipable deity of the Brahmins. So why was he inclined to put a Brahmin into such a terrible condition of lamentation over one son after another until the ninth son was taken away? The answer is that Lord Mahavishnu was so anxious to see Krishna that he did not hesitate even to give trouble to a Brahmin. Although giving trouble to a Brahmin is a forbidden act, Lord Vishnu was prepared to do anything in order to see Krishna, 
He was so anxious to see him. After losing each of his sons, the Brahmin would come to the gate of the palace and accuse the king of not being able to give the Brahmins protection and of thus being unfit to sit on the royal throne. It was Maha Vishnu's plan that the Brahmin would accuse the Kshatriyas and Krishna, and Krishna would be obliged to come see him to take back the Brahmin's sons. Still another question may be raised. If Maha Vishnu cannot see Krishna, then how was Krishna obliged to come before him, after all, to take back the sons of the Brahmin? The answer is that Lord Krishna went to see Lord Maha Vishnu not exactly to take away the sons of the Brahmin, but only for Arjuna's sake. His friendship with Arjuna was so intimate that when Arjun prepared himself to die by entering the fire, Krishna wanted to give him complete protection. Arjun, however, would not desist from entering the fire unless the sons of the Brahmin were brought back. Therefore Krishna promised him, I shall bring back the Brahmin's sons. Do not try to commit suicide. If Lord Krishna were going to see Lord Vishnu only to reclaim the sons of the Brahmin, then he would not have waited until the ninth son was taken. But when the ninth son was taken away by Lord Maha Vishnu, and Arjun was therefore ready to enter the fire because his promise was going to prove false, that serious situation made Lord Krishna decide to go with Arjun to see Maha Vishnu. It is said that Arjun is an empowered incarnation of Nara Narayan. He is even sometimes called Nara Narayan. The Nara Narayan incarnation is also one of Lord Vishnu's plenary expansions. Therefore, when Krishna and Arjun went to see Lord Vishnu, it is to be understood that Arjun visited in his Nara Narayan capacity just as Krishna, when he displayed his pastimes in Dvorka, acted in his Vasudev capacity. After visiting the spiritual world, Arjun concluded that whatever opulence anyone can show within the material or spiritual worlds is all a gift of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is manifested in various forms as Vishnu Tattva and Jiva Tattva, or in other words, as Svamsha and Vibhinamsha. Vishnu Tattva is known as Svamsha, and Jiva Tattva is known as Vibhinamsha. He can therefore display himself by different transcendental pastimes in the portion of either Svamsha or Vibhinamsha, as he likes, but still he remains the original Supreme Personality of Godhead. The concluding portion of Krishna's pastimes is found in the 90th chapter of the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And in this chapter, Shukdev Goswami wanted to explain how Krishna lived happily at Vorka with all opulences. Krishna's opulence of strength has already been displayed in his different pastimes, and now it will be shown 
how his residence at Dvorka displayed his opulences of wealth and beauty. In this material world, which is only a perverted reflection of the spiritual world, the opulences of wealth and beauty are considered the highest of all opulences. Therefore, while Krishna stayed on this planet as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, His opulences of wealth and beauty had no comparison within the three worlds. Krishna enjoyed 16,000 beautiful wives, and it is most significant that he lived at Dvorka as the only husband of these thousands of beautiful women. It is specifically stated in this connection that he was the only husband of 16,000 wives. It is, of course, not unheard of in the history of the world that a powerful king would keep many hundreds of queens, but although such a king might be the only husband of so many wives, he could not enjoy all of them at one time. Krishna, however, enjoyed all of his 16,000 wives simultaneously. Although it may be said that yogis can also expand their bodies into many forms, the yogi's expansion and Lord Krishna's expansion are not the same. Krishna is therefore sometimes called Yogeshvar, the master of all yogis. In the Vedic literature, we find that the yogi, Saubhari Muni, expanded himself into eight but that expansion was like a television expansion. The television image is manifested in millions of expansions, but those expansions cannot act differently. They are simply reflections of the original and can only act exactly as the original does. Krishna's expansion is not material, like the expansion of the television or the yogi. When Narad visited the different palaces of Krishna, he saw that Krishna, in his different expansions, was variously engaged in each and every palace of the queens. It is also said that Krishna lived in Dvorka as the husband of the goddess of fortune. Queen Rukmini is the goddess of fortune, and all the other queens are her expansions. So Krishna, the chief of the Vrishni dynasty, enjoyed with the goddess of fortune in full opulence. The queens of Krishna are described as permanently youthful and beautiful. Although Krishna had grandchildren and great-grandchildren, neither Krishna nor his queens looked older than sixteen or twenty years of age. The young queens were so beautiful that when they moved, they appeared like lightning moving in the sky. They were always dressed with exalted ornaments and garments and were always engaged in sportive activities like dancing, singing, or playing ball on the roofs of the palaces. The dancing and tennis playing of girls in the material world appear to be perverted reflections of the original pastimes of the original personality of Godhead, Krishna and his wives. The roads and streets of the city of Dvorka were always crowded with elephants, horses, chariots, and infantry soldiers. 
When elephants are engaged in service, they are given liquor to drink, and it is said that the elephants in Dvorka were given so much liquor that they would sprinkle a great quantity of it on the road and still walk on the streets intoxicated. The infantry soldiers passing on the streets were profusely decorated with gold ornaments, and horses and golden chariots plied along the streets. In all directions of Dvorka city, wherever one would turn his eyes, he would find green parks and gardens, each of them filled with trees and plants laden with fruits and flowers. Because there were so many nice trees of fruits and flowers, all the sweetly chirping birds and buzzing bumblebees joined together to make sweet vibrations. The city of Dvorka thus fully displayed all opulences. The heroes of the dynasty of Yadu used to think themselves the most fortunate residents of the city, and actually they enjoyed all transcendental facilities. All the 16,000 palaces of Krishna's queens were situated in this beautiful city of Dvorka, and Lord Krishna, the supreme eternal enjoyer of all these facilities, expanded himself into 16,000 forms and simultaneously engaged in different family affairs in those 16,000 palaces. In each and every one of the palaces, there were nicely decorated gardens and lakes. The crystal clear water of the lakes contained many blooming lotus flowers of different colors, like blue, yellow, white, and red, and the saffron powder from the lotus flowers was blown all around by the breeze. All the lakes were full of beautiful swans, ducks, and cranes, crying occasionally with melodious sounds. Lord Sri Krishna sometimes entered those lakes or the rivers with his wives and enjoyed swimming pastimes with them in full jubilation. Sometimes the wives of Lord Krishna, who are all goddesses of fortune, would embrace the Lord in the midst of the water while swimming or taking bath, and the red vermilion of Kunkum decorating the beauty of their breasts would adorn the chest of the Lord with a reddish color. The impersonalists would not dare believe that in the spiritual world there are such varieties of enjoyment. But in order to demonstrate the factual, ever-blissful enjoyment in the spiritual world, Lord Krishna descended on this planet and showed that the spiritual world is not devoid of such pleasurable facilities of life. The only difference is that in the spiritual world such facilities are eternal, never-ending occurrences whereas in the material world they are simply impermanent, perverted reflections. When Lord Krishna was engaged in such enjoyment, the Gandharvas and professional musicians would glorify him with melodious musical concerts accompanied by murdungas, drums, kettle drums, stringed instruments, and brass bugles and the whole atmosphere would change into a greatly festive celebration. In a festive mood, the wives of the Lord would sometimes sprinkle water on the Lord's body with a syringe-like instrument, and the Lord would similarly wet the bodies of the queens. When Lord Krishna and the queens engaged themselves in these pastimes, it seemed as if the heavenly king, Yaksharaj, were engaged in pastimes with his many wives. Yaksharaj is also known as Kuvera and is considered the treasurer of the heavenly kingdom. 
When the wives of Lord Krishna thus became wet, their breasts and thighs would increase in beauty a thousand times, and their long hair would fall down to decorate those parts of their bodies. The beautiful flowers placed in their hair would fall, and the queens, being seemingly harassed by the Lord's throwing water at them, would approach him on the plea of snatching the syringe-like instrument. This attempt would create a situation wherein the Lord could embrace them as they willingly approached Him. Upon being embraced, the wives of the Lord would feel on their mouths a clear indication of conjugal love, and this would create an atmosphere of spiritual bliss. When the garland on the neck of the Lord then touched the breasts of the queens, their whole bodies became covered with saffron yellow. Being engaged in their celestial pastimes, the queens forgot themselves, and their loosened hair appeared like beautiful waves of a river. When the queens sprinkled water on the body of Krishna, or he sprinkled water on the bodies of the queens, the whole situation appeared just like that of an elephant enjoying in a lake with many she-elephants. After enjoying fully amongst themselves, the queens and Lord Krishna would come out of the water, and they would give up their wet garments, which were very valuable, to be taken away by the professional singers and dancers. These singers and dancers had no other means of subsistence than the rewards of valuable garments and ornaments left by the queens and kings on such occasions. The whole system of society was so well planned that all the members of the society in their different positions as Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras had no difficulty in earning their livelihood. There was no competition among the divisions of society. The original conception of the caste system was so planned that one group of men engaged in a particular type of occupation would not compete with another group of men engaged in a different occupation. In this way, Lord Krishna used to enjoy the company of his 16,000 wives. Devotees of the Lord who want to love the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the mellow of conjugal love are elevated to the position of becoming wives of Krishna, and Krishna keeps them always attached to Him by His kind behavior. Krishna's behavior with His wives, His movements, His talking with them, his smiling, his embracing, and similar other activities, just like those of a loving husband, kept them always very much attached to him. That is the highest perfection of life. If someone remains always attached to Krishna, it is to be understood that he is liberated and his life is successful. With any devotee who loves Krishna with his heart and soul, Krishna reciprocates in such a way that the devotee cannot remain unattached to him. The reciprocal dealings of Krishna and his devotees are so attractive that a devotee cannot think of any subject matter other than Krishna. For all the queens, Krishna only was their worshipable objective. They were always absorbed in thought of Krishna, the lotus-eyed and beautifully blackish personality of Godhead. Sometimes in thought of Krishna, they remain silent, and in great ecstasy of Bab and Anubhav, 
They sometimes spoke as if in delirium. Sometimes, even in the presence of Lord Krishna, they vividly described the pastimes they had enjoyed in the lake or river with him. Some of such talk may be described here. One of the queens said to the bird Korari, My dear Korari, now it is very late at night. Everyone is sleeping. The whole world is now calm and peaceful. At this time, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is sleeping, although His knowledge is undisturbed by any circumstances. Then why are you not sleeping? Why are you lamenting like this throughout the whole night? My dear friend, is it that you are also attracted by the lotus eyes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and by His sweet smiling and attractive words exactly as I am? Do those dealings of the Supreme Personality of Godhead pinch your heart as they do mine? Hello, Chakravaki. Why have you closed your eyes? Are you searching after your husband who may have gone to foreign countries? Why are you lamenting so pitiably? Alas, it appears that you are very much aggrieved. Or is it a fact that you also are willing to become an eternal servitor of the Supreme Personality of Godhead? I think that you are anxious to put a garland on the lotus feet of the Lord and then place it on your hair. O oh, my dear ocean, why are you roaring all day and night? Don't you like to sleep? I think you have been attacked by insomnia, or if I am not wrong, my dear Shyamasundra has tactfully taken away your gravity and power of forbearance, which are your natural qualifications. Is it a fact that for this reason you are suffering from insomnia like me? Yes, I admit that there is no remedy for this disease. My dear Moon God, I think you have been attacked by a severe type of tuberculosis. For this reason you are becoming thinner and thinner day by day. Oh, my Lord, you are now so weak that your thin rays cannot dissipate the darkness of night. Or is it a fact that, just as I have, you also have been stunned by the mysteriously sweet words of my Lord Shamasundra? Is it a fact that it is because of this severe anxiety that you are so grave? O oh, breeze from the Himalayas, what have I done to you that you are so intent on teasing me by awakening my lust to meet Krishna? Do you not know that I have already been injured by the crooked policy of the personality of Godhead? My dear Himalayan breeze, please know that I have already been stricken. There is no need to injure me more and more. My dear beautiful cloud, the color of your beautiful body exactly resembles the bodily you of my dear most Shamasundra. I think, therefore, that you are very much dear to my Lord, the chief of the dynasty of the Yadus, and because you are so dear to him, you are absorbed in meditation exactly as I am. I can appreciate that your heart is full of anxiety for Shamasundra. You appear excessively eager to see him and I see that for this reason only drops of tears are gliding down from your eyes just as they are from mine. My dear black cloud, we must admit frankly that to establish an intimate relationship with Shamasundra means to purchase unnecessary anxieties while we are otherwise comfortable at home. Generally, the cuckoo sounds its cooing vibration at the end of night or early in the morning. 
When the queens heard the cooing of the cuckoo at the end of night, they said, Dear cuckoo, your voice is very sweet. As soon as you vibrate your sweet voice, we immediately remember Shama Sundara, because your voice exactly resembles his. We must frankly admit that your voice is imbued with nectar, and it is so invigorating that it is competent to bring back life to those almost dead in separation from their dear most friend. So we are very much obliged to you. Please let us know how we can welcome you or how we can do something for you. The queens continued talking like that, and they addressed the mountain as follows. Dear mountain, you are very generous. By your gravity only, the whole crust of this earth is properly maintained, although because you are discharging your duties very faithfully, you do not know how to move. Because you are so grave, you do not move hither and thither, nor do you say anything. Rather, you always appear in a thoughtful mood. It may be that you are always thinking of a very grave and important subject matter, but we can guess very clearly what you are thinking of. We are sure that you are thinking of placing the lotus feet of Shamasundra on your raised peaks, as we want to place his lotus feet on our raised breasts. Dear Dry Rivers, We know that because this is the summer season, all your beds are dry and you have no water. Because all your water has now been dried up, you are no longer beautified by blooming lotus flowers. At the present moment, you appear very lean and thin, so we can understand that your position is exactly like ours. We have lost everything due to being separated from Shamasundra, and we no longer hear his pleasing words. Our hearts no longer work properly and therefore we also have become very lean and thin. We think, therefore, that you are just like us. You have turned lean and thin because you are not getting any water from your husband, the ocean, through the clouds. The example given herewith by the queens is very appropriate. The riverbeds become dry when the ocean no longer supplies water through the clouds. The ocean is supposed to be the husband of the river and therefore is supposed to support her. Unless a woman is supported by her husband with the necessities of life, she also becomes as dry as a dry river. One queen addressed a swan as follows. My dear swan, please come here, come here. You are welcome. Please sit down and take some milk. My dear swan, can you tell me if you have any message from Shamasundra? I take you to be a messenger from him. If you have any such news, please tell me. Our Shamasundra is always very independent. He never comes under the control of anyone. We have all failed to control him, and therefore we ask you, is he keeping himself well? I may inform you that Shamasundra is very fickle. His friendship is always temporary. It breaks even by slight agitation. But would you kindly explain why he is so unkind to me? Formerly he said that I alone am his dear most wife. Does he remember this assurance? Anyway, you are welcome. Please sit down but I cannot accept your entreaty to go to Shamasundra. When he does not care for me, why should I be mad after him? I am very sorry to let you know that you have become the messenger of a poor-hearted soul. You are asking me to go to him, but I am not going. What is that? You talk of his coming to me? Does he desire to come here to fulfill my long expectation for him? All right, you may bring him here, but don't bring with him his most beloved goddess of fortune, 
Do you think that he cannot be separated from the goddess of fortune even for a moment? Could he not come here alone without Lakshmi? His behavior is very displeasing. Does it mean that without Lakshmi, Shamasundra cannot be happy? Can't he be happy with any other wife? Does it mean that the goddess of fortune has the ocean of love for him and none of us can compare to her? All the wives of Lord Krishna were completely absorbed in thought of him. Krishna is known as Yogeshvar, the master of all yogis, and all the wives of Krishna at Dvorka used to keep this Yogeshvar within their hearts. Instead of trying to be master of all yogic mystic powers, it is better if one simply keeps the supreme Yogeshvar, Krishna, within his heart. Thus one's life can become perfect and one can very easily be transferred to the kingdom of God. It is to be understood that all the queens of Krishna who lived with him at Dvorka were in their previous lives very greatly exalted devotees who wanted to establish a relationship with Krishna in conjugal love. Thus they were given the chance to become his wives and enjoy a constant loving relationship with him. Ultimately, they were all transferred to the Vaikuntha planets. The Supreme Absolute Truth, Personality of Godhead, is never impersonal. All the Vedic literatures glorify the transcendental performance of his various personal activities and pastimes. It is said that in the Vedas and in the Ramayana, only the activities of the Lord are described. Everywhere in the Vedic literature, his glories are sung. As soon as soft-hearted people such as women, hear those transcendental pastimes of Lord Krishna, they immediately become attracted to Him. Soft-hearted women and girls are therefore very easily drawn to the Krishna Consciousness Movement. One who is thus drawn to the Krishna Consciousness Movement and tries to keep himself in constant touch with such consciousness certainly gets the supreme salvation going back to Krishna at Golok Vrindavan. If simply by developing Krishna consciousness one can be transferred to the spiritual world, one can simply imagine how blissful and blessed were the queens of Lord Krishna who talked with him personally and saw Lord Krishna face to face. No one can properly describe the fortune of the wives of Lord Krishna. They took care of him personally by rendering various transcendental services like bathing him, feeding him, pleasing him, and serving him. Thus no one's austerities can compare to the service of the queens at Dvorka. Shukdev Goswami informed Maharaj Pariksit that for self-realization the austerities and penances performed by the queens at Dvorka have no comparison. The objective of self-realization is one, Krishna. Therefore, although the dealings of the queens with Krishna appear just like ordinary dealings between husband and wife, the principal point to be observed 
is the queen's attachment for Krishna. The entire process of austerity and penance is meant to detach one from the material world and enhance one's attachment to Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Krishna is the shelter of all persons advancing in self-realization. As an ideal householder, he lived with his wives and performed the Vedic rituals just to show less intelligent persons that the Supreme Lord is never impersonal. Krishna lived with wife and children in all opulence, exactly like an ordinary conditioned soul, just to exemplify to those souls who are actually conditioned that one may enter into the circle of family life as long as Krishna is the center. For example, the members of the Yadu dynasty lived in the family of Krishna, and Krishna was the center of all their activities. Renunciation is not as important as enhancing one's attachment to Krishna. The Krishna Consciousness Movement is especially meant for this purpose. We are preaching on the principle that it does not matter whether a man is a sannyasi or a grahasta. One simply has to increase his attachment for Krishna and then his life is successful. Following in the footsteps of Lord Sri Krishna, one can live with his family members or within the society or nation, not for the purpose of indulging in sense gratification, but to realize Krishna by advancing in attachment for him. There are four principles of elevation from conditioned life to the life of liberation, which are technically known as Dharma, Artha, Kama, and moksha, or religion, economic development, sense gratification, and liberation. If one lives a family life following in the footsteps of Lord Krishna's family members, one can achieve all four of these principles of success simultaneously by making Krishna the center of all activities. It is already known to us that Krishna had 16,108 wives. All these wives were exalted, liberated souls, and among them Queen Rukmini was the chief. After Rukmini, there were seven other principal wives, and the names of the sons of these eight principal queens have already been mentioned. Besides these eight queens, Lord Krishna had ten sons by each of the other queens. Thus altogether, Krishna's children numbered 16,108 times ten. One should not be astonished to hear that Krishna had so many sons. One should always remember that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and that He has unlimited potencies. He claims all living entities as his sons, so even if he had 16 million sons attached to him personally, there would be no cause for astonishment. Among Krishna's greatly powerful sons, 18 sons were Maharatas. The Maharatas could fight alone against many thousands of soldiers, charioteers, cavalry, and elephants. The reputations of these eighteen sons are very widespread and are described in almost all the Vedic literatures. The eighteen Maharata sons are listed as Pradyumna, Aniruddha, Diptiman, Banu, Samba, Madhu, Brihadbanu, Chitrabhanu, Vrik, Arun, Pushkar, Vedabahu, Shrutadev, Sunandan, Chitrabahu, Virup, Kavi, and Niagroda. 
Of these eighteen Maharata sons of Krishna, Pradyumna is considered the foremost. Pradyumna happened to be the eldest son of Queen Rukmini, and he inherited all the qualities of his great father, Lord Krishna. He married the daughter of his maternal uncle, Rukmi, and from that marriage Aniruddha was born. Aniruddha was so powerful that he could fight against ten thousand elephants. He married the granddaughter of Rukmi, who was the brother of his grandmother, Rukmini. Because the relationship between these cousins was distant, such a marriage was not uncommon. Aniruddha's son was Vajra. When the whole Yadu dynasty was destroyed by the curse of a Brahmin, only Vajra survived. Vajra had one son, whose name was Pratibahu. The son of Pratibahu was named Subahu. The son of Subahu was named Shantasain. And the son of Shantasain was Shatasain. It is stated by Shukdev Goswami that all the members of the Yadu dynasty had many children. Just as Krishna had many sons, grandsons and great-grandsons, each one of the kings named herewith also had similar family extensions. Not only did all of them have many children, but all were extraordinarily rich and opulent. None of them were weak and short-lived, and above all, all the members of the Yadu dynasty were staunch devotees of the Brahminical culture. It is the duty of the Kshatriya kings to maintain the Brahminical culture and protect the qualified Brahmins, and all these kings discharge their duties rightly. The members of the Yadu dynasty were so numerous that it would be very difficult to describe them all, even if one had a duration of life of many thousands of years. Srila Shukdev Goswami informed Maharaj Parikshit that he had heard from reliable sources that simply to teach the children of the Yadu dynasty there were as many as 38,800,000 tutors or acharyas. If so many teachers were needed to educate their children, one can simply imagine how vast was the number of family members. As for their military strength, it is said that King Ugrasen alone had ten quadrillion soldiers as personal bodyguards. Before the advent of Lord Krishna within this universe, there were many battles between the demons and the demigods. Many demons died in the fighting, and they all were given the chance to take birth in high royal families on this earth. Because of their royal exalted posts, all these demons became very much puffed up, and their only business was to harass their subjects. Lord Krishna appeared on this planet just at the end of Dvapara Yug to annihilate all these demoniac kings. As it is said in the Bhagavad Gita, Paritranaya sadunam vinashaya cha dushkritam. The Lord comes to protect the devotees and annihilate the miscreants. Some of the demigods were also asked to appear on this earth to assist in the transcendental pastimes of Lord Krishna. When Krishna appeared, he came in the association of his eternal servitors, but the demigods also were requested to come down to assist him, and thus all of them took their births in the Yadu dynasty. The Yadu dynasty had 101 clans in different parts of the country. All the members of these different clans respected Lord Krishna in a manner befitting his divine position and all of them were his devotees, heart and soul. Thus all the members of the Yadu dynasty were very opulent, happy, and prosperous, and they had no anxieties. Because of their implicit faith in and devotion to Lord Krishna, 
they were never defeated by any other kings. Their love of Krishna was so intense that in their regular activities, in sitting, sleeping, traveling, talking, sporting, cleansing, and bathing, they were simply absorbed in thoughts of Krishna and paid no attention to bodily necessities. That is the symptom of a pure devotee of Lord Krishna. Just as when a man is fully absorbed in some particular thought, he sometimes forgets his other bodily activities, the members of the Yadu dynasty acted automatically for their bodily necessities, but their actual attention was always fixed on Krishna. Their bodily activities were performed mechanically, but their minds were always absorbed in Krishna consciousness. Srila Shukdev Goswami has concluded the 90th chapter of the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam by pointing out five particular excellences of Lord Krishna. The first excellence is that before Lord Krishna's appearance in the Yadu family, the river Ganges was known as the purest of all things. Even impure things could be purified simply by touching the water of the Ganges. This super-excellent power of the Ganges water was due to its having emanated from the toe of Lord Vishnu. But when Lord Krishna, the supreme Vishnu, appeared in the family of the Yadu dynasty, he traveled personally throughout the kingdom of the Yadus, and by his intimate association with the Yadu dynasty, the whole family not only became very famous, but also became more effective in purifying others than the water of the Ganges. The next excellence of Lord Krishna's appearance was that although he apparently gave protection to the devotees and annihilated the demons, both the devotees and the demons achieved the same result. Lord Krishna is the bestower of five kinds of liberation, of which Sayuja Mukti, or the liberation of becoming one with the Supreme, was given to the demons like Kamsa, whereas the gopis were given the chance to associate with him personally. The gopis kept their individuality to enjoy the company of Lord Krishna, but Kamsa was accepted into his impersonal brahma -gyoti. In other words, both the demons and the gopis were spiritually liberated. But because the demons were enemies and the gopis were friends, the demons were killed and the gopis protected. The third excellence of Lord Krishna's appearance was that the goddess of fortune, who is worshipped by demigods like Lord Brahma, Indra, and Chandra, remained always engaged in the service of the Lord, even though the Lord gave more preference to the gopis. Lakshmiji, the goddess of fortune, tried her best to be on an equal level with the gopis, but she was not successful. Nevertheless, she remained faithful to Krishna, although she generally does not remain in one place, even if worshipped by demigods like Lord Brahma. The fourth excellence of Lord Krishna's appearance concerns the glories of His name. It is stated in the Vedic literature that by chanting the different names of Lord Vishnu a thousand times, one may be bestowed with the same benefits as by thrice chanting the holy name of Lord Ram. And by chanting the holy name of Lord Krishna only once, one receives the same benefit. 
In other words, of all the holy names of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, including Vishnu and Ram, the holy name of Krishna is the most powerful. The Vedic literature therefore specifically stresses the chanting of the holy name of Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Lord Chaitanya introduced this chanting of the holy name of Krishna in this age, thus making liberation more easily obtainable than in other ages. In other words, Lord Krishna is more excellent than his other incarnations, although all of them are equally the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The fifth excellence of Lord Krishna's appearance is that he established the most excellent of all religious principles by his one statement in the Bhagavad Gita, that simply by surrendering unto him, one can discharge all the principles of religious rites. In the Vedic literature, there are twenty kinds of religious principles mentioned, and each of them is described in different shastras. But Lord Krishna is so kind to the fallen conditioned souls of this age that he personally appeared and asked everyone to give up all kinds of religious rites and simply surrender unto him. It is said that this age of Kali is three-fourths devoid of religious principles. Hardly one-fourth of the principles of religion are still observed in this age. But by the mercy of Lord Krishna, not only has this vacancy of Kali Yug been completely filled, but the religious process has been made so easy that simply by rendering transcendental loving service unto Lord Krishna, by chanting His holy names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, one can achieve the highest result of religion, namely being transferred to the highest planet within the spiritual world, Golok Vrindavan. One can thus immediately estimate the benefit of Lord Krishna's appearance and understand that his giving relief to the people of the world by his appearance was not at all extraordinary. Srila Shukdev Goswami thus concludes his description of the super-exalted position of Lord Krishna by glorifying him in the following way. O Lord Krishna, all glories unto you. You are present in everyone's heart as Paramatma. Therefore you are known as Jananivas, one who lives in everyone's heart. As confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita, Ishvara Sarva Bhutanam Hirdeshe Arjuna Tishtati. The Supreme Lord, in His Paramatma feature, lives within everyone's heart. This does not mean, however, that Krishna has no separate existence as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Mayavadi philosophers accept the all pervading feature of Parabrahman. But when Parabrahman, or the Supreme Lord, appears, they think that he appears under the control of material nature. Because Lord Krishna appeared as the son of Devaki, the Mayavadi philosophers accept Krishna to be an ordinary living entity who takes birth within this material world. Therefore, Shukdev Goswami warns them that Devaki Janmavad which means that although Krishna is famous as the son of Devaki, actually he is the super-soul or the all-pervading supreme personality of Godhead. 
The devotees, however, take this word, Devaki Janmavad, in a different way. The devotees understand that actually Krishna was the son of Mother Yashoda. Although Krishna first appeared as the son of Devaki, he immediately transferred himself to the lap of Mother Yashoda, and his childhood pastimes were blissfully enjoyed by Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj. This fact was also admitted by Vasudev himself when he met Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda at Kurukshetra. He admitted that Krishna and Balaram were actually the sons of Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj. Vasudev and Devaki were only their official father and mother. Their actual father and mother were Nanda and Yashoda. Therefore, Shukdev Goswami addresses Lord Krishna as Devaki Janmavad. Shukdev Goswami then glorifies the Lord as one who is honored by the Yadu Varu Parishat, the assembly house of the Yadu dynasty, and as the killer of different kinds of demons. Krishna, the supreme personality of Godhead, could have killed all the demons by employing his different material energies, but he wanted to kill them personally to give them salvation. There was no need of Krishna's coming to this material world to kill the demons. Simply by his willing, many hundreds and thousands of demons could have been killed without his personal endeavor. But actually, he descended for his pure devotees to play as a child with Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj and to give pleasure to the inhabitants of Dvorka. By killing the demons and giving protection to the devotees, Lord Krishna established the real religious principle, which is simply love of God. By following the factual religious principles of love of God, even the living entities, known as Stira Chada, were also delivered of all material contamination and transferred to the spiritual kingdom. Stira means the trees and plants which cannot move, and Chada means the moving animals, especially the cows. When Krishna was present, he delivered all the trees, monkeys, and other plants and animals who happened to see him and serve him, both in Vrindavan and in Dvorka. Lord Krishna is especially glorified for giving pleasure to the gopis and the queens of Dvorka. Shukdev Goswami glorifies Lord Krishna for his enchanting smile, by which he enchanted not only the gopis at Vrindavan, but also the queens at Dvorka. The exact words used in this connection are Vardayan Kamadevam. In Vrindavan, as the boyfriend of many gopis, and in Dvorka, as the husband of many queens, Krishna increased their lusty desires to enjoy with him. For God-realization or self-realization, one generally has to undergo severe austerities and penances for many, many thousands of years, and then it may be possible to realize God. But the gopis and the queens of Dvorka simply by enhancing their lusty desires to enjoy Krishna as their boyfriend or husband, receive the highest type of salvation. The behavior of Lord Krishna with the gopis and queens is unique 
in the history of self-realization. Usually people understand that for self-realization one has to go to the forest or mountains and undergo severe austerities and penances. But the gopis and the queens, simply by being attached to Krishna in conjugal love and enjoying his company in a so-called sensuous life full of luxury and opulence, achieved the highest salvation, which is impossible to achieve even for great sages and saintly persons. Similarly, the demons such as Kamsa, Dantavakra, and Shishupal also got the highest benefit of being transferred to the spiritual world. In the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Vyasadeva offered his respectful obeisances to the Supreme Truth, Vasudeva or Krishna. After that, he taught his son, Shukdev Goswami, to preach Srimad Bhagavatam. It is in this connection that Shukdev Goswami glorifies the Lord with the word Jayati. Following in the footsteps of Srila Vyasadeva, Shukdeva Goswami and all the Acharyas in disciplic succession, the whole population of the world should glorify Lord Krishna, and for their best interest they should take to this Krishna consciousness movement. The process is easy and helpful. It is simply to chant the Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Lord Chaitanya has therefore recommended that one be callous to the material ups and downs. Material life is temporary, and so the ups and downs of life may come and go. When they come, one should be as tolerant as a tree, and as humble and meek as the straw in the street. But certainly he must engage himself in Krishna consciousness by chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, the Supersoul of all living entities, out of His causeless mercy comes down and manifests His different transcendental pastimes in different incarnations. Hearing the attractive pastimes of Lord Krishna's different incarnations is a chance for liberation for the conditioned soul and the most fascinating and pleasing activities of Lord Krishna Himself are still more attractive because Lord Krishna personally is all attractive. Following in the footsteps of Srila Shukdev Goswami, we have tried to present this book, Krishna, for being read and heard by the conditioned souls of this age. By hearing the pastimes of Lord Krishna, one is sure and certain to get salvation and be transferred back home, back to Godhead. It is recommended by Shukdev Goswami that as we hear the transcendental pastimes and activities of the Lord, we gradually cut the knots 
of material contamination. Therefore, regardless of what one is, if one wants the association of Lord Krishna in the transcendental kingdom of God for eternity in blissful existence, one must hear about the pastimes of Lord Krishna and chant the Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. The transcendental pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, are so powerful that simply by hearing, reading, and memorizing this book, Krishna, one is sure to be transferred to the spiritual world, which is ordinarily very difficult to achieve. The description of the pastimes of Lord Krishna is so attractive that it automatically gives us an impetus to study repeatedly and the more we study the pastimes of the Lord, the more we become attached to Him. This very attachment to Krishna makes one eligible to be transferred to His abode, Golok Vrindavan. As we have learned from the previous chapter, to cross over the material world is to cross over the stringent laws of material nature. The stringent laws of material nature cannot check the progress of one who is attracted by the spiritual nature. This is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita by the Lord Himself. Although the stringent laws of material nature are very difficult to overcome, if one surrenders unto the Lord, he can very easily cross over nations. There is, however, no influence of material nature in the spiritual world. As we have learned from the second canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, the ruling power of the demigods and the influence of material nature are conspicuous by their absence in the spiritual world. Srila Shukdev Goswami has therefore advised Maharaj Pariksit in the beginning of the second canto that every conditioned soul should engage himself in hearing and chanting the transcendental pastimes of the Lord. Srila Shukdev Goswami also informed King Pariksit that previously many other kings and emperors went to the jungle to prosecute severe austerities and penances in order to go back home, back to Godhead. In India, it is still a practice that many advanced transcendentalists give up their family lives and go to Vrindavan to live there alone and completely engage in hearing and chanting of the holy pastimes of the Lord. This system is recommended in the Srimad Bhagavatam, and the six Goswamis of Vrindavan followed it. But at the present moment, many karmis and pseudo-devotees have overcrowded the holy place of Vrindavan just to imitate this process recommended by Shukdev Goswami. It is said that many kings and emperors formerly went to the forest for this purpose. But Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur does not recommend that one take up this solitary life in Vrindavan prematurely. One who goes prematurely to Vrindavan to live in pursuance of the instructions of Shukdev Goswami again falls a victim to Maya, even while residing in Vrindavan. To check such unauthorized residence in Vrindavan, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur has sung a nice song in this connection, the purport of which is as follows. 
My dear mind, why are you so proud of being a Vaishnav? Your solitary worship and chanting of the holy name of the Lord are based on a desire for cheap popularity, and therefore your chanting of the holy name is only a pretension. Such an ambition for a cheap reputation may be compared to the stool of a hog because such popularity is another extension of the influence of Maya. One may go to Vrindavan for cheap popularity, and instead of being absorbed in Krishna consciousness, one may always think of money and women, which are simply temporary sources of happiness. It is better that one engage whatever money and women he may have in his possession in the service of the Lord, because sense enjoyment is not for the conditioned soul. The master of the senses is Rishikesh, Lord Krishna. Therefore the senses should always be engaged in his service. As for material reputation, there were many demons, like Ravan, who wanted to go against the laws of material nature, but they all failed. One should therefore not take to the demoniac activity of claiming to be a Vaishnav just for false prestige without performing service to the Lord. But when one engages oneself in the devotional service of the Lord, automatically the Vaishnav reputation comes to him. There is no need to be envious of the devotees who are engaged in preaching the glories of the Lord. We have practical experience of being advised by the so-called Babajis in Vrindavan that there is no need to preach and that it is better to live in Vrindavan in a solitary place and chant the holy name. Such Babajis do not know that if one is engaged in preaching or in glorifying the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the good reputation of a preacher automatically follows one. One should not therefore prematurely give up the honest life of a householder to lead a life of debauchery in Vrindavan. Srila Shukdev Goswami's recommendation to leave home and go to the forest in search of Krishna is not for immature persons. Maharaj Parikshit was mature. Even in his householder life, or from the very beginning of his life, he worshipped Lord Krishna's Murti. In his childhood, he worshipped the deity of Lord Krishna. And later, although he was a householder, he was always detached, and therefore, when he got the notice of his death, he immediately gave up all connection with household life and sat down on the bank of the Ganges to hear Srimad Bhagavatam in the association of devotees. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the third volume, twenty-first chapter of Krishna, summary description of Lord Krishna's pastimes. And thus ends Volume 3 of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. All glories to Lord Sri Krishna, and all glories to His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, the author of this wonderful summary study of the Lord's pastimes and philosophy.